Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Prashant. Uh, can you guys hear me? Hi. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for joining in. Um, let me introduce Abhinav. Abhinav um, is founder of Encipher. Uh, they do uh, pretty good uh, work in mobile application security space. Uh, they have an open source tool called Moblexer. Uh, I, I request all you guys to check it out. Um, also, Abhinav has uh, sponsored some of our OWASP event. Uh, I do a small event in India called uh, OWASP Sea Sites. Uh, Abhinav has sponsored, um, uh, sponsored, generously sponsored that event a couple of times. So over, over to you, Abhinav. Let's get started. Thank you, Prashant. I hope everyone can hear me now. Uh, just a quick check, Prashant, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, thanks a lot everybody for joining. Uh, thanks a lot, Prashant, for inviting me uh, for this talk. Uh, it's quite late here in India. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody according to their place. Uh, all right, so uh, this talk is going to be about uh, iOS application vulnerabilities. Um, I've got to know that the talk is about uh, around one hour or so. So I'll try to cover uh, multiple different parts of um, pen testing or uh, the approach to find iOS uh, vulnerabilities in iOS applications. So that's that's what pretty much what we're going to talk about. Uh, so before uh, starting the obvious introduction, uh, obviously, Prashant has already introduced me and uh, and Cyphers a bit, but uh, this is just something that I would like to share again. So I uh, I run a company named Encyphers. We are an information security consulting company. We do provide penetration testing trainings uh, and responsible disclosure consultancy. These are the main three services that we do that we provide. Uh, uh, we are based out of India. We have been providing trainings on web, mobile uh, hacking, infrastructure hacking. Uh, for quite some time, and we have given trainings for a lot of clients in India and abroad. Uh, my name is Abhinav Mishra. I'm the founder of Encyphers. I have around 10 years or so experience in penetration testing of web mobile infrastructure. Um, I do take, uh, I do uh, work as a trainer as well for uh, the trainings that uh, my company offers. Um, the whole team actually has uh, different uh, people from different backgrounds. Some of them are uh, very proficient in mobile application hacking. Some of them are web application hackers. And then um, a lot of us are love, just love giving trainings. So that's, that's pretty much what we do. You can find us on Twitter at Enciphers. You can go to our website. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it about uh, us. Now let's get to the real thing. Right, so at any point of time, I'm not sure how Prashant, you guys handle the queries. Uh, uh, I'm not really familiar with the uh, what the structure is going to be. Uh, are we supposed to take any breaks in the one of the time? Um, we'll take the questions at the end, uh, you know. Yeah, and, and do we have to take any break, five, 10 minutes break in between, or it's fine if I just go ahead with the, the whole session? Yeah, you can go with the whole session. Ah, that's fine, that's fine, cool. Right, so uh, so as, an, as the name suggests itself, uh, should I start my camera as well? Uh, let me see so that you guys can actually spot me next time when you see me. <laughs> right, so that's me. Uh, so as the name suggests, uh, this talk is going to be about uh, iOS application vulnerabilities. Uh, and we, we are going to talk about some of the iOS application issues, uh, what type of common issues are there and how to get started with finding um, and pen testing iOS applications and so on and so forth. So basically we are first going to talk about how to get started. If you are a developer who has been developing applications in iOS uh, or a pen tester who has been pen testing web applications and Android application and want to get started with iOS application or you have been testing iOS application for quite some time and you want to maybe scale up, learn something else, something new or probably get more deeper into it. So I'll try to uh, give some introduction of how to get started and then we'll talk about what are the uh, how, what are the different approach, not different approach, but what, what is the generic approach uh, uh, while approaching to target or test an iOS application. We'll talk about some of the common iOS application vulnerabilities um, um, and of course, how to find them. 
right? I'll, I'll, I'll keep on, the slide itself has a lot of uh, resources. Uh, wherever I saw, I found it applicable to provide a link of the resource. I have provided it so that whenever the slide is up, uh, accessible to all of you, you guys can go ahead and have uh, access to those resources as well. And that's, that's pretty much it, what we're going to talk about in the next, uh, say, 50 minutes or so, 53 minutes to be specific. All right, so, so first thing first, uh, getting started with iOS, iOS pen testing, one of the very, very common things that I hear, and I, I was actually watching this space, uh, the, the meetup page on where, where you guys actually post the details of the session, and I found that somebody actually asked the first question that somebody asked was about um, what are the other type of uh, simulators or emulators available. So first thing, so, so I'll, I'll try to, uh, answer these common questions as well while we are starting. So first thing is basically, uh, as far as I know, there are no public emulator or simulator or common app of, uh, emulator or simulators available, uh, which can be used for pen testing of IOS application. Now, a couple of simulators that we have, so a simulators comes with uh, Xcode itself. So Xcode is software that runs uh, on Macs. I'm sure you, almost all of you must be knowing about it. So as, as soon as you install Xcode, you get access to some of the simulators as well. But uh, the sad part is, for a, from a pen testing point of view, you can't use those simulators for pen testing itself because those those have a lot of uh, uh, those are not emulators. They are basically simulators, so they have a lot of restrictions. They are not exactly as a real phone. Um, so 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 pretty much you are stuck with it. There's one company which does a lot of uh, virtual iOS devices known as Corellium. I'm not sure how many of you have used them. They were um, kind enough to sponsor my last training at Nalcon in um, Goa this year itself. Um, so they have a, a, a virtual, they are the only company who offers virtual iOS devices. Um, uh, but uh, I don't know if, uh, I'm not sure if they are still offer uh, to individual users or not. So probably that is something that you have to check on the website or something. Now, apart from that, there are no such devices or there are no such uh, emulators or simulators you can. So the first requirement probably a must have is to have an i device. It can be an iPhone, iPad, any, any of them. So an I, iOS device on which you can install the application that you want to test and then proceed further. So an i device is probably one of the must uh, to have things before you start the pen testing work. Now, the second part, second question is that do we um, need to have a Mac? Is it a mandatory requirement to get started with iOS pen testing? Short answer, no, that's not a mandatory requirement. So there are a lot of things that you, you would need a Mac for, right? Uh, basically, the most important part is uh, when you want to sign an application or you want to play around with an application, rebuild the application, or pretty much do anything related to Xcode or signing of the IPA. If you want to work or do anything in that sort, then you will be stuck and you will have to use a uh, Mac, uh, more specifically an Xcode or a signing um, uh, tool for, uh, for Mac, for IPAs. So that's, that's probably not a requirement, but, uh, but actually something that you might miss um, and get stuck at some point. But to get started, not at all um, a requirement. And that is one of the reasons why we created Mobexler. So I'll talk about Mobexler in a bit, but here is the website. Meanwhile, uh, while I'm talking about the other things, you can go ahead and have a look at the website, mobexler.com. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why we, why we created Mobexler. So in our training, we realized that uh, in our Android, it is easier for people to set up their own environment and things like that uh, for pen testing. But in, our, in case of iOS applications, it is, uh, it is quite difficult to exactly figure it out that what type of application should be installed, whether the iOS device is going to be connected into a uh, Linux-based uh, virtual machine or not, so on and so forth. So we had multiple questions. So we thought of why not create a a uh, specific virtual machine environment, which should be uh, helpful for pen testers to do pen testing on Android as well as iOS applications. So this is one um, virtual uh, machine you can say, which has all the tools required for pen testing the Android application as well as pen testing the iOS application. So we'll talk about and we'll probably see some of the things uh, I'm going to work on uh, MobX itself um, um, in, in, in a few minutes. Sorry. Um, the second thing, the, the, probably the third thing is that do we have, third thing is that do we need to have an Apple account, probably a developer's Apple account. Uh, so again, that is also not mandatory. It's good to have, but not mandatory. So to, re, to get started, so right away get started with uh, pen testing of, or, or, or security testing of iOS application, the minimum requirement you need to have is an iDevice. Preferably at this point of time, so every point of time where you are 
pen testing in iOS field or iOS application field. Uh, there is a sweet spot of an iOS version which works probably with the majority of application, can be jailbroken easily, and the jailbreak is stable. So there are very few iOS versions on that. So currently, what I feel is that iOS iPhone 6, iPhone 7, iPhone 8, these are the iPhones which you can go ahead and buy uh, from the market. And if they have any iOS version lower than iOS 13 or probably uh, iOS, still iOS 13.5, then you're good to go. You can just buy the device from the market and then just go ahead to the CheckRain website and then download the tool, jailbreak tool called CheckRain. Um, I have listed it onto the slide, but I'll just show it to you guys here. So you can download the tool, you can go ahead and jailbreak your phone, and then you should be good enough, uh, and you should be good to go. Um, and then once you have the ID device, a jailbroken ID device ready with you, the next thing is that either you have a Mac and you install all of these tools, or you just download the MobXler OBA file from here, and then set it up on any Windows Linux based um, operating system, any, any of your host computers. Um, the MobXler has almost all the tools that, that are going to be needed for iOS pen testing. Uh, together with that, basically, once you have the setup, like you have a Mac or a MobXler environment and you have an iPhone or an i device, which is jailbroken, now you're pretty much uh, ready to go. Now, the second, the first thing that comes to mind is what to do, where to start with the pen testing. So we, we also created a checklist on the MobXler website itself. You go to uh, mobile application pen testing checklist, you'll find a detailed checklist on iOS and Android as well. So you can just go ahead and follow the iOS part. And you will get to know that what to do, where to start, what tools to use, probably from the uh, MobXler or uh, from the internet, what other tools you can use. And then you can follow along this whole checklist. And then uh, that is going to at least give you, get you started with pen testing. Now, if you are not using Mob MobXler as the pen testing environment, you can still install a couple of good tools into your Mac and then get started. So one of the things is SSH, which obviously comes pre-installed. Uh, but you'll have to install um, OpenSSH onto the jailbroken device. Uh, Frida objection is something that you want to install on both of the platform, that is on your Mac as well as your i device, Burp Suite, Ghidra, uh, Hopper, or IDA, any of these, any of these three tools. Uh, uh, so this is this is the very basic or the very minimum of uh, what you would require to just get started with iOS pen testing. Of course, in one hour, I won't be able to cover pretty much everything of how to set up things, how to do this, how to do that, but I'll try to explain at least the basics of it and I'll try to explain uh, whatever I can in this limited amount of time and show you how to do that uh, using MobXR and some things using a few things using uh, the Mac itself. All right, so uh, Prashant, do I have to answer the questions right now or I think it should be part for the Yeah, you can go ahead, uh, let me know. All right, all right guys, keep, keep shooting the questions, no problem in that, I'll answer them um, at the end. Right, so, so once we have all of these things, the next thing is that how to get started, what things to test. So I, already, so I already told you guys that you can just go ahead and have a look at the iOS pen testing checklist that we created. We keep on updating it and uh, very frequently as, as much as we can. And uh, then this, this, this is something that would get you started with iOS pen testing. Now, once you have everything set up, um, uh, you have a beautiful environment set up and running. Then the next thing is that too, get started with actual testing. So let me just for, to give you guys a feel of it, I have probably um, MobXler running on my laptop. I think you might not be able to see it. So let me share the screen again. And probably I'll share the whole screen. Desktop one. Right. So this is how the MobXler would look once you install it. And this has, uh, I'll just give you a quick walkthrough. This have a couple of uh, zones. We have categorized it to Android zone and an iOS zone. Um, so the iOS zone is basically what you would be looking into it if you are concerned about iOS pen testing. These have, this, this have a couple of interesting tool set tools which you can use probably, and probably we're going to see a couple of them. So that's, that's what MobXler is. It is nothing but a mobile application penetration testing platform, free and open source. So initially we created it, it based on, it was created based on um, uh, uh, elementary OS, but we realized that uh, I wanted to do that because it is for iOS pen testing. So I wanted to give a feel of Mac, but we realized that the size of the whole system, whole OVA became too large. So we again created another version of it, which is called MobX Lite. And the Lite is around, Six, six or seven GBs of space that it takes, but it works very few, uh, 
uh, very smooth and uh, so that's why we moved from mobixlay to mobixlay light right so once you have set up uh, once you have all of these things set up it is very easy to actually plug in the device let me probably show you guys here so i have an iphone in fact running um, attached to my back right now right so this is nothing if i show you guys this is nothing but uh, an ios running version 12.4.7 and uh, it is connected to the mac right now but let's say that i don't want to use mac for the pen testing i don't want to install a bunch of tools but i rather want to use mobixler so what i have to do probably is just plug out the device from mac plug in again and once you plug in it will ask you where you want to plug in and uh, it should ask you i'll just select connect to linux and it will just connect the device inside mobexler as soon as the device is connected inside mobexler uh, all the tools get access to the phone and then i can pretty much start with using whatever tools i want so as simple as connecting any real device just using usb i'm right now on a mac but you can do the same with uh, uh, windows you can use it on vmware as well as on virtual box right so so we have pretty much everything set up with us and then and and now we we probably can get started with um the real testing of the device so so how do we actually approach when we have a mac when we have an ios application and we want to do a pen testing of the same ios application so on a very broad level the whole pen testing approach is basically divided into two different parts right so the first part is called called the static analysis and the next part is called and the second part is called dynamic analysis uh, a very uh, top level um, categorization would be this now in the static analysis as the name suggests itself that you basically test for everything um, that can be tested statically right you do not run the application you do not many make any network calls and things so and so forth you just have the ipa which is actually the package of uh, ios application goes by the extension ipa.ipa so you just have the ipa and you want to get started with testing it so whatever you do with the ipa is basically what what comes in the static analysis so so if you want to do that first thing to understand is what is what is an ipa so basically an ipa is whenever a developer develops an application all the code gets compiled into one uh, file and then together with all the resources file that the application needs all of them combined together forms one a kind of a zip format is uh, with an extension ipa is basically the package file that gets um, created when the application is uh, um, compiled now this ipa file is basically what is being uploaded onto play store now this is what you download from uh, app store and uh, install into your phone and then use it now so the first thing to do the static analysis is obviously the ipa to get um, to get access to the ipa now in android it is very simple to just export you can you, there are a bunch of utilities that can that you can use to simply export the ipa from the phone itself and share it it becomes a little a bit difficult in in case of uh, ios because uh, any application downloaded from the uh, app store itself is encrypted on each device so basically one device having the same application would have the application encrypted into a different with a different uh, uh, key than the other one so basically each application is in a way unique to uh, the files are encrypted on a device uniquely so you cannot just simply go ahead and export the ip as such rather you have to use some techniques to extract some how they extract the ip from the device itself so now for example i have connected my device uh, to mac and uh, i'll talk about couple of tools like one of the very frequently used tools in ios pen testing is frida so frida is already set up onto the mobexler and uh, um, the i device so i can just fetch the names of uh, applications that are installed or probably running onto the device and one of the interesting applications is uber so let's try to i do not have the ipa so the first thing if you remember i have to do an static analysis so the first thing is to getting is the first step is to get the ipa now there are two options to get the ipa i can either go to the direct directly to the development team which would work if this is a white box pen test or an internal company pen test you can just go to the development team ask them to create an ipa for you and then just email you or probably upload it to a shared drive or something and then you can start with the static analysis but what if it is a black box pen test and all you have given is a url or an app store link so in that case you can the first thing you need to do is basically go ahead and uh, somehow get access to the ipa so the so the so the first step probably is to get 
extract the IP. Now, to do that, if you go to the iOS zone um, inside the Mobix, there you'll find a utility called Frida iOS dump. And this is what will help you to quickly fetch the IPA from the device itself. So I'll just simply go again uh, to Frida iOS dump directory. And probably run, so you can go to the Frida iOS dump GitHub page and learn how does it work and probably how to extract it. I am just going to simply show you guys how to do this. Uh, to extract the IPA, Uber IPA from the device itself. So currently the device has an Uber application installed from App Store. I'm just going to download it on my MobXLR machine um, in an un unencrypted IP. I want to download the unencrypted IPA from my device to the MobXLR. So I'll just quickly run it. Uh, so it basically actually uh, starts an iProxy server and then iProxy connection with the device. And then that's how the application started. So now this is asking the application to start. Let me see if. Okay, so now it is saying that dumping Uber and now it started. Right, so uh, I think it will take a couple of seconds or minutes because the Uber IP is quite big. Right, so it is. it has started already downloading. It is 114 MBs. This is just the first file and there will be a couple of files downloaded. Once we have everything downloaded, probably you will have an IPA uh, over here. Uh, okay, so. So once you have it running, let me open this iOS zone and probably go to Frida iOS dump and you'll have an IPA over here with the name uber.ipa. Right, so once we have uh, the IPA, the first thing we are going to do is basically an static analysis. Now let's understand while the Uber IPA or any other IPA is getting extracted, let's understand that why we are doing this. So once we have the IPA, I told you guys that the IPA is nothing but a zip of all the source code plus uh, the binary plus the uh, which has the source code in the compiled format plus all the resources file and other bunch of things which the application needs to work. So what we actually want to do is we get we want to get hold of the binary file which actually have all the compiled source code so that we can reverse engineer the source code and then can have a look inside the source code probably or the, the disassembled version of the binary file to understand the application better. Because once we understand the application better, once we have some access to the source code or probably a, a de de disassembled application itself, then it, it, it will help us to understand how the application functions. If there are any client-side security controls in, implemented, we can actually look, into, look more into it and then um, understand how it is working and then do a bunch of other things, probably bypass it or you know, do, do a, any that sort of things. Now, one another important point why we are doing a static analysis is that uh, in a lot of cases, basically once we once developers are while developers are actually creating the application, they often tend to include a lot of sensitive information inside the source code, which gets shipped in the production builder as well. And because the whole source code gets compiled and there is no uh, upfront access for anybody to look into the source code, it is a common assumption that this, that people are not going to look into the source code. But if you can extract the IPA reverse extract the binary from the IPA and then reverse engineer the binary to look into the original um, the strings inside the source code or probably to understand the source code better. There are chances that you can extract the information or sensitive details from the source code itself, from the binary itself. And that is one of the very, very important um, thing that we do into pen testing of iOS applications. Uh, the, the, you can go ahead look at different multiple uh, pen testing reports. I'm sure that you will end up finding a huge amount of huge, huge amount of uh, issues, security issues in which developers has often um, left a lot of sensitive information inside the application source code and a pen tester or a reverse engineer get hold of that data. And then this could be very critical. One of the very interesting blogs that I read recently was this. Uh, which talks about how a lot of uh, application actually had a lot of actual app application actually had an hockey key, hockey app API keys inside them. Um, so all the developers on the call probably would understand what um, 
hockey app is basically and hockey app is basically something like uh, an application or a third party service which developers used to share the ip or the build between themselves now a lot of production bit of these application actually had the so the api tokens hidden inside them these tokens could be then used to perform a lot of to get access to internal details of the application probably internal details of other application as well so i have given a link of this uh, this very interesting blog in my slide uh, once the session is over you guys can have an access to it and then read about this blog so this is one of the important reasons why we need the ipa uh, and the uh, binary as well to look into the source code now all right still running so i'll keep it i'll leave it running probably i already saved one extracted ip for you guys so we'll probably look into that so abstractus is the another application that was saved inside abstractus is one of the training application that we use in our um ios and um, android application hacking trainings so now let's look into these this ip and understand how this actually works so if i open so as i said that ip is nothing but a zipped uh, file and can, it contains a huge amount of uh, files that is required for the application to work together with a binary file which has the compiled version of the source code so that is probably the most important part of it so let's unzip this and uh, let's extract all the information that is there inside this file so as soon as we unzip it we got a payload folder which would be uh, probably be in all the application that we the majority of the application that you compile that you unzip so if we go inside say so if we go inside the payload folder you will find an abstractus.app folder and let me just go ahead inside it this is a binary file which has the source code and these are the uh, supporting files you can see that there is a certificate file and there are a bunch of info.p list and bunch of other files as well now uh, another important thing that we can do is probably so once we have access to the once we have access to the source code uh, to the ipa file and we extracted the binary probably we can use the same binary file to disassemble using ghidra or hopper or ida right so i have already opened this to save time i have over, already opened this ghidra and loaded the same abstractus binary file over it and now you can see that it has decompiled let me do the same for you guys using hopper which i think uh shows it in a better way not better way but at least in a more cleaner way i think or uh, maybe i am i have more uh, i've been working more with hopper so that's why right so uh so you you can see over here that once i loaded the binary file inside the uh, ghidra i can actually try the demo let me probably or i can just simply go to the i'm just going to give the binary file to hopper also so that it can perform the disassembling of it this is the binary file i'll just drag and drop it here it will automatically find the type of it sorry it can automatically find the type of it and start the decompilation process now once that's done i will have a bunch of information to look at now that is the part of static analysis that we need to do so we extracted we looked into the disassembled code in ghidra hopper or any uh, disassembler uh, we can also extract class information which is very important so class information you can extract using multiple other tools also using uh, frida also you can there are a lot of uh, dep frida dependent tools which you can use Uh, mobsf is one of the, the static code analyzer for ipa which is a part of mobxer also so you can just drag and drop and if it supports it will extract the class information for you so you can have a look at the class information looking at the names of classes and functions and diff different things you can find you can pretty much guess what the application is doing and what and you can deduce that what the application tries to do where it puts some clients and restrictions so on and so forth and then remember that the most important part that we are looking at looking into is the hard coded sensitive information or probably any client side security control that we can bypass right so that's that's pretty much it one another important thing that you can do while testing the application itself so this is probably the first 
couple of hours uh, in any pen test of iOS application. Now, another thing is that you can have a look at strings that the application is showing. So if you see that once the disassembling of the binary is done, there, is, there are a lot of strings that are there. So you can also use strings from Hopper or search for strings inside Ghidra itself. I think there is an option inside tools, no, inside search, and you can search for the strings so from here. Uh, so you can basically use any of these tools and look for strings. And a lot of times you will end up finding a lot of very interesting strings itself. Like if I search for pin, you'll see SSL pinning is a string. You'll see a lot of API endpoints are there. Uh, so without you even installing the application, you can actually have a look at all of these different, very interesting things inside the application itself. And you can see that there are a lot of, it seems like an SQL query being run and, 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 and so on and so forth. So you can actually find a lot of very, very interesting things inside the binary itself just by disassembling it. Right? So that's, that's basically the first initial part of any uh, black box box or even a white box, uh, not white box, but black box or gray box uh, pen test of an iOS application. Now, while you're doing this, remember that the main objective that we want to, do, that the main objective of this is to uh, either get access to, somehow get access to the internal hard-coded sensitive information, uh, which should not be there inside the production build of the application, or bypass some uh, security controls that the application is putting. Now, once we once we are done with that, once we have the IPA, when we have the extracted the IPA, once we have disassembled the code, we looked into the source code. The next, the next part, probably thing, the next most important part is to bypass security controls like SSL pinning, jailbreak detection. So how we do it is basically, let's say that the application is implementing a jailbreak detection. So what a jailbreak detection is, is that if you install an application on a jailbroken device and the application runs and have a jailbreak detection code implemented, what it will do is it will try to find whether the device on which the application is running is jailbroken or not. If it is jailbroken, it will it can choose to do a bunch of things. For example, it can prompt you that the device is jailbroken and the application is going to quit. It might not even prompt you and directly the application just crashes. So any of these are, are basically, or in some cases it might even prompt you that the, real, the device is jailbroken and you are taking a risk by running the application onto the compromise device. Uh, so you can do anything, but in order to pen test the application and you want to use it on jailbroken device, the first thing you, you want to do is to, buy, to bypass this type of protection. So one of the very common protection is that a jailbroken, of a jailbroken device. There could be a bun bunch of other protections also, but this is just an example. So you can disassemble the binary itself. There are a bunch of other ways uh, to bypass jailbreak detection. There are, there are utilities, there are tools. But one of the interesting uh, ways of bypassing such type of protection because it is a client side protection is to disassemble the code, find the exact point or the logic where the application is checking for and the response of that logic, like the return value of that logic. So you need to deduce the, you need to uh, figure out the flow of the code and then change that code. Once you figure out the flow of the code and change that code, you can use Ghidra itself to create a new binary. Once you create a new binary, you can then replace the previous binary repack the application again, resign it, and then install onto the device. Then in that case, that security control would be bypassed because it is only on client side. So, so bypassing, uh, there can be multiple bunch of examples on this, right? So one of the examples is bypassing the jailbreak detection. Another example could be bypassing of SSL pinning. There could be bunch of other examples also. Like for example, I was testing, I was doing a pen test recently on an application. Um, which had an option for users to provide an uh, OTP. And then there was no brute force protection on the backend for this OTP request. The only protection on the brute, brute force was on the app itself, probably on the app itself. So, uh, so if you put the OTP inside the application itself, uh, um, any, any six digit characters you put inside and then you submit the, click the button to uh, validate you so that there is an API call, which actually checks in the background, whether the, uh, OTP is correct or not, and then responds to you whether it is correct or not. Now, in this case, to brute force, to stop the brute force, what they did is basically they put a timer on the login button or this validation of uh, OTP button. Now, in order to bypass this, you can actually go ahead and look at the uh, flow of the code itself, and if uh, and 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 if the so the application was checking that what was the last time um, when the OTP was validated, and the, if if it is being done very frequently, then run a timer and then check whether how, how long has it been since the time is running? And then based on that, decide whether the application should 
uh, gray out the button or should allow the user to put the, to hit the button. So you can actually change that logic. And in, in irrespective of what the response of the timer, you can always choose the button to not gray out. So this type of security controls, which are on a client side, client side, can be actually replaced in uh, can be actually um, bypassed in a lot of cases just by disassembling the source code, deducing the whole thing, and then um, rebuilding the new binary and then uh, shipping it onto the device. Now, of course, this in order to do all of this, you will need to have a basic, at least a basic understanding of reverse engineering and a basic understanding of how to use these disassembling or reverse engineering tools like Gitra or Ida or Hopper. Uh, Again, because the time is limited, I cannot just go into details of how to do that. But, but this is this is the main intent of why we do that, why we do it. Now, once the dynamic analysis part is done, once we have uh, looked into the binary itself, looked into the package itself, together with looking into the source code of the binary, we remember we also have the a lot of details once we extracted the application. So, if you look here, if you look go to desktop. Together with the binary file, which is this, there are a lot of other files also. Like there's an info plist file, there's an entitlements file, there are a lot of other files also. So it can be, it is also very important. The static analysis also include to test for, um, look into all of these files which are there and then try to find if there are any issues, if there are any sensitive details inside these files also. So it is not only important to look into the source code, this is simple code, but also important to look probably on each and every file, which is there, which is a packet, which is the part of the IP or the package itself. Now, once we have done that, the static analysis part is done. The second part is basically the dynamic analysis. Now in dynamic analysis, as the, as the name suggests, we actually install the application. You need to install the application onto the device and then run it, analyze it features. So probably the first thing you need to do is basically run the application, look into different features that the application gives you. Uh, probably make a note of all type of security controls that the application put and then verify whether these security controls are only on the client side or is there a validation at the backend also backend means the the backend web server or the api server so if this is if the security control is only been implemented on the client side then that can be bypassed as i said um like uh, and so on and so forth now once you install the application you are running the application the first thing or probably the made the most important part of any ios application or a mobile application pen test is to look into the request and response that the application is generating which is also known as the apps traffic so all of these applications that we use these days are basically very very smart applications they make a lot of backend api calls to talk to a backend application or a rest api server and then do uh, actions uh, on behalf of the user now these so so the so the major action that happens in the application is basically happy, happening using these API requests and responses. So that is the major chunk of what has been happening into the application. And that is also where you should, as a pen tester, put the, a lot of focus on. Now to do that, you need to capture the SSL traffic, capture the traffic of the application. Now, these days, almost, I see a lot of application, a lot of developers and a lot of companies actually putting SSL pinning as a protection, which is a great thing. Few years back, around two or three years back, it was not the case. Now, SSL pinning is extremely common. Pretty much every application that you see uh, on App Store these days have SSL pinning implemented. Now, if the SSL pinning is there, you cannot just go ahead and capture their traffic. You need to bypass SSL pinning first. How do we do that? You again connect the application. So there can be multiple ways of bypassing SSL pinning, jailbreak detection, these type of common protection mechanisms onto iOS onto, on, in iOS application. So to bypass them, you can use Frida or Objection. There are other of the compilation of code is of course uh, of the app is of course a, a, an option. Uh, there are other uh, CDA based utilities that you can use onto your device. There are other uh, tools also that you can install onto your iOS, and they will help you. They might help you in bypassing SSL pinning or jailbreak detection. Now, once you have bypassed these jailbreak detection or SSL pinning, you can capture the traffic, look at the request and response, and then and then test for all the API-related security issues. Now, the API-related security issues are a major, major, major thing. Now, so let me give you a quick demo of how to do that. So now, for example, um, while I am trying to use the abstractus application that I was running, if I try to use it on my device, let me show you guys. I have already set it up to use the proxy, uh, the burp suit running on my device. If I try to log in, 
I'll get, you see the dashboard blinked and I get a failed renegotiation on the server, right? The abstractors.com. Now it means that the SSL pinning is implemented and I cannot simply go ahead and capture the traffic. So I'll just quickly give you guys, just to get you guys, make you familiar with these things. Uh, and just quickly show you how Frida or probably objection can be used to bypass this. Control C, let me exit this. Uh, so Uber is probably would have extracted. Let me show you guys quickly before going ahead. So I go to iOS zone, iOS dump, and here's Uber IPA, right? So let me remove that. We already saw how to do that. Now let me just start uh, a terminal and because my device is already connected to the MobX layer, I can just simply go ahead and fetch a list of all the applications that are running onto the device. Now we saw that we tried to capture the traffic of AppSectors application, which we are not able to do that. Do that. So let's try to bypass that using Objection, which is a tool based on Frida itself. Amazing tool, very helpful. Um, uh, very helpful uh, in iOS application pen test. So we can just do objection and use the uh, connected to the iOS device and that's it. So because I know for a fact that there is an option in an uh, objection, I can simply use iOS as self pinning disabled. There are a lot of blogs and videos and bunch of resources on the internet that you can refer to how to do, how to use objection to bypass. This is not a hundred percent sure shot solution, of course. Um, but it works a fairly amount of time. Uh, not all the time, not even 50% of the time, I would say, but still uh, even less than 50% is a very, very um, big number, I would say, because it helps, it saves a lot of time. So uh, now if I want to capture the traffic, it will bypass the SSL pinning on the go and I should be able to capture the traffic. And if you see over here, it is just the modifying the return value of a lot of uh, checks. And then I should have the request and response over here. Right, so this is the request that I gave and then this is the response, so on and so forth. Right, so so this is how you bypass the, uh, the request and the, bypass the SSL pinning and capture the request and response. Now, once you do that, you have all the requests and response, the next part or probably the most important part of any dynamic analysis is to have a look at the request and response or the application traffic which the application is sending. Now, once you have access to that, you can actually go ahead and test these API endpoints. Sorry, for a lot of things. Like for example, testing them for in-situ direct object preference, access control issues, authentication issues, authentication bypass, any of those sort of things. And then, and that is, and that is, that is probably a major chunk of any iOS application pen test. Now, you can also find any client set restriction while the application is running, as I gave you an example of an OTP validation uh, feature. That was a client side restriction. It could be bypassed using a runtime uh, manipulation or runtime instrumentation using Frida. You can actually find the uh, func class name and the method name which is being used to implement that client side check and can modify the return value of it to change the decision that the app is making. And then that is how you can bypass a lot of security controls which are implemented on the client side. So these, these are some of the things that you do while doing the dynamic analysis. Now, once these type of things are done, of course, you'll end up finding a you might end up finding a lot of issues with the APIs. You might end up bypassing a lot of security controls locally. Remember that bypassing SSL pinning, if SSL pinning is implemented or bypassing jailbreak detection is basically is actually not a security issue. This is another very common question that I get. Um, uh, one of the reasons these are not a security issue or probably I would not report bypass of an SSL pinning into my, um, uh, into my pen test report is because if the SSL pinning is properly implemented and you are bypassing it by jailbreaking a device now hooking into the application and then you know, modifying the runtime uh, values and doing runtime instrumentation. You cannot just go ahead and do it, do the same thing on a majority of users and capture their traffic onto your laptop. That is not, that is not possible. So whatever you're doing it is doing your, on your own device or your own uh, phone itself. And that is how, and that is why it is not a security issue for the application itself. Same goes with the jailbreak detection also. So, so not having an SSL pinning can be a security issue or probably is a security issue that if the application is handling sensitive information, but bypassing it using your own device and on your own phone is not a security issue, either jailbreak detection or SSL pinning. 
Now, once you have tested all of these things, once you have tested the local security implementation, security controls, you have tested the request and response, you have tested the APIs. Another very important thing is the local storage. So all of these applications which talk to the server basically actually also have a local, um, also store a lot of information, user uh, sensitive information locally onto the device. So the next part is to check whether these, whether the information is which is being saved locally is important or not, right? It, whether it is uh, securely stored or not. Now, in order to find that, there are multiple ways that iOS provides to application developers to store data. Now, one of the major important, or probably the most important points to remember or to know is that Keychain is probably the best place to store any sensitive data. So, if there is a session ID, if there is a JWT token, so any that sort of things, it should be stored into Keychain uh, in the best possible way, probably and not in any other type of storage, maybe an um, plist file or maybe a uh, you know core data or probably an SQLite database um, in the applications data directory, so on and so forth. So these, these, these are not the best way to store some type of sensitive information. So this type of uh, judgment of what data the application is storing and where it is storing should be done in each application. So you should find that how the application is handling users, users data and how it is uh, storing it into under the device. Now there's no one straight short rule that how to handle any data. So first thing to do is to categorize the data based on how sensitive it is. Like you cannot just any application which allows you to download a picture from the internet uh, should not be asked to store it into the most secure place on the device because the category of the data is not as sensitive as the user's password or the JWT token. So first you have to uh, find that what is the category of that data, what type, what, what is the sensitivity of that data and then based on that, you can suggest the developer or the development team of how to how best to uh, store them onto the device. Now, Apple has a lot of documentation on their website of how to, when to use what type of data probably. Keychain, as I said, is one of the best places on the iOS device to store any sensitive information. But at the same time, it cannot be just used to store PDFs or any such of thing. Keychain is nothing but an, kind of an SQLite DB itself, which the iOS manages. So you can store uh, text or JSON type of, like, any, any simple text information uh, inside it. So JWT token session identifier are probably the most common things to store into keychain. Now you have to take a call based on the sensitivity of the data of where to store it, either to store it onto the onto a SQLite database or to store it somewhere else onto the device. So local device storage exploration is another very extremely important part of the uh, iOS security testing approach. Now, once you have done all of these things, now let's, uh, so this is this is generally, in order to test the local storage, you can use a bunch of tools. I, you can directly connect, so the device, once you jailbreak the device, the device has uh, become, you have a root access onto the iOS. Now, once you have the root access on the iOS, you can install a bunch of utilities using CDR. CDR is basically an, a kind of an app store which comes with jailbroken, which, for a jailbroken device which has a lot of utilities. One of the common utilities is OpenSSH. So you install OpenSSH using CDR on your iPhone, and then you use your Mac or any laptop to SSH from your main computer, from your Mac or laptop inside the device. So for example, if I want to connect to it, I think I should be able to directly access it. Let me look at the IP address. So it is, uh, I will just do, SSH root at the rate 192.168.0.9 and I will say yes and I will provide it the default password which should work and that's it. So I'm now connected as root through SSH inside my iPhone. I can do LS, I can look at all the directories which the iOS actually has and can you know explore all the information. Similarly, there is a data directory inside the application I don't think I have a lot of time left for going into all of those sort of things, but there is a late data directory that you should explore and look into it and probably explore and see what type of application, what type of data the application is actually storing onto the device. Now, once you have done all of these things, let's look into what type of common, what are the common iOS application vulnerabilities that we actually find into uh, penetration tests. So again, as I said, this is not in sequence of most common ones, but these are generally the, the most common ones. So not in the sequence guys. So one of the very common things is of course the sensitive information inside the hard coded inside it, the code. Now, uh, from my uh, experience, what I have seen in uh, the printers that we do as enciphers for our clients is that 
that Android developers has realized this as a matter of fact that the Java source code can very easily or Kotlin source code that can very easily be reverse engineer uh, engineered and uh, reverse engineers or pen testers can get access to it. So they so the information that is getting hard coded into an Java source code or an Android applications code is probably lesser than what we see into iOS case. So iOS application tend to have a lot of very very sensitive. I have seen. Um, a lot of very sensitive internal company uh, company details or information inside hard coded inside the application it could be an api secret key it could be an api key it could be an aws configuration secret files i have seen basic authentication maybe a dozen times uh, in which the basic authentication is being used somehow to actually make a call to the back end any developer endpoint which the developer was probably using while developing the application um, hard coded uh, root accounts hard coded accounts for the application uh, hidden features is extremely 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 common so uh, this is something that i have seen in a lot of application if 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 there are a lot of developers on the call probably you would relate to it that the developers actually make hidden debug menu or make hidden menus inside the application even on the production builds and these these are just denied or somehow with xyg protection or just the source code is probably just not enabled with some function or some 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 method or somewhere in the code itself but but this, but because the source code is there, but because the code is a part of the production build, it has been extremely common for me to find these debug hidden menus inside the production application. So if you decompile the source code, look into the source code, you will end up finding a lot of debug menus or a lot of hidden menus. These hidden menus are probably in most of the cases have a lot of features which can be very useful. Like for example, in a lot of cases, I have seen that there is a debug menu and the debug menu lets the users to actually export um, all the local storage or various critical files from the local storage and send it across to a remote server, probably because maybe because developer wanted to do that or probably send the logs, enable logs, X, Y, Z things, so kind of things. Maybe there are hidden features which are into uh, development and which will be used in future. Um, but they have been, but the developer has already started working on that. So that is the code of it is a part of the source code and the API endpoint is also a part of it. So maybe. Uh, API slash v1 slash user is what the application is using now, but the source code also has API slash v1 slash admin slash user is something that the that, that will come later into the application build. But because some part of the code has already been written, it is part of the source code. You actually, once you reverse engineer the source code, you get hold of this API endpoint. You can go to the API endpoint and can probably do some damage. Uh, so that's, that's one of the very, very common uh, security uh, issue that we end up finding into these iOS application pen tests that we do for our clients. Now, bypassing security control, OTP bypass is one of the very common examples. Not very common example, but now the recent examples that I saw that our team actually did work on bypassing pin protection. So there are a lot of application put a pin security control, uh, a pin login page login into the application, which actually lets users to log in. So these debug menus, for example, these debug menus that I'm talking about, these hidden secret menus into the application are actually protected a lot of time using a pin. Now the fun part is that the pin is also a part of the source code because the, the, the pin protection or the pin login is actually being done on the client side itself. So once you decompile, decompile the application, look at the source code, you don't only, you do not only find the debug menu, you actually also find a hidden um, access to it. For example, let me, uh, let me rather show you guys one, one thing is that, so this, I'll probably take one minute for it. All right. Sorry guys, not a good, very good face to look at. Uh, I actually wanted to show the screen over here. Just hold on a second. So what I'm going to show you is guys, guys is an example of the same type of issue that I have been talking about. So if I select this, this should not be here. Okay. And first, uh, right. So here it is. So if you see, this is a application that I have, we have been looking at. 
Now, this application looks very fine as long as you use it. This is, again, as I said, this is a training application that we use. But if you look into it, unless you decompile the source code, look into the application source code and look into the interesting field. One of the very interesting find field is that is that if you tap six times onto the abstractors part, you'll see there is a hidden menu, right? Now, this menu is only is going to be accessible to you once you have given a pin to it. Now, this pin is not known to anyone of you, right? Unless you know the source code or you have looked into the source code. But if you look into it, if you look at the working of this application, you'll know that the pin is actually a part of the source code. It has to be somewhere in the source code. And then if it is a, it is a part of the source code, this could be bypassed. And once you bypass this pin protection, you can actually get hold of the secret menu, right? So probably if I just do show you guys, if you do this, you actually get access to the internal hidden menu of the application. Now, just to give you an example, so this is a training application, but this is the idea to implement this into our training application came from the real pen test itself. Like I've seen a lot of such debug menus. So that's, that's the idea. That's the inspiration that we got. Now together with that, um, so bypassing client side security controls. And then the ne next very extremely common one is the API security issues like insecure direct object reference. Another very good read is that I think this, this blog is for an uh, Android application, but I think this very, very beautifully describes how, uh, how an um, client side security control can be bypassed. So in this blog, you will read that the application actually encrypts the request that is going from the application. So even if you bypass SSL pinning, capture the request, the parameters or the request values are itself encrypted. But by using a runtime instrumentation, you can get the value of those uh, encrypted values and decrypted values and then perform uh, IDORs. And because the developer assumed that nobody is going to decrypt the, uh, these values, there, is no, there was no check uh, access control check on the back end. Very good blog written over here. I really appreciate, I really recommend all of you to go ahead and read it probably after the call once you have access to this. And then again, um, insecure direct object reference, missing access control, authentication issues, so and so forth are probably the common type of issues that we find. Insecure local storage, another very important part, as I showed you guys that the pin was a part, but it has to be, in this example, there was a hidden menu and it is asking for a pin. So it is very obvious that the pin has to be a part of the source code. So if you look into the source code, somewhere you'll end, at least end up finding the pin. Once you have the pin, good to go. Uh, insecure cryptography. So a lot of times databases, local databases or SQLite DBs that the application creates are is encrypted, but the encryption key is again a part of the source code itself. So if you decompile the source code, you get the key, you can again decrypt the uh, databases. Once you decrypt the database or if the application encryption key is a part of the source code, you know that the same key is basically used for all the applications. So irrespective of uh, who is using the application, all of their databases are going to be encrypted the same way. Very bad type of cryptography implemented, but again, kind of a common security issue that we see. Together with that, using vulnerable software components in secure frameworks or libraries, which are being used. Uh, so frameworks get updated, but the, but, but the older versions are being used in some application. And these are common examples. Deep links are very interesting approach. I don't think we have a lot of time, but if you go ahead and read about deep links or URL schemes, you'll find, you end up finding that there are a lot of uh, very good findings on the internet. And uh, you can go ahead and look at hacker one findings and probably some other ways. Hacker one does not have a lot of iOS findings. I think a lot of, not a lot of people are working on iOS these days, but again, deep links are very interesting part and you can actually find a lot of interesting vulnerabilities related to deep links or URL schemes in iOS applications as well as Android, of course. Now, one of the important, very quickly, I'll try to summer up, uh, I'll try to just cover up uh, this part is that what type of security issues or what type of vulnerabilities can be actually exploited when the device is not jail jailbroken, right? So this is a very common question that a lot of people ask me. So, so the first thing is, of course, deep links. So any feature related vulnerability. So deep links is a feature that our application actually offers to the users. So any feature related uh, vulnerabilities, uh, one of the common is one of the common example is deep links. So anything, any security issue, if you find related to deep link, it is going to be easily exploitable and no jailbreak is needed to, uh, needed to do that. Man in the middle or transport layer security issues are going to be, can be exploited without even jailbreaking the device, jailbreaking the device. Any API security issue, any authentication issue onto the uh, issue onto the phone, any logical issue onto the uh, application. These are the common examples of issues that you can find into or the vulnerabilities that you can find into an iOS application. And they are going to be, uh, they can be exploited even if the device is not jailbroken. 
unintended data leakage via logs, insecure cryptography, as I gave you an example of that the, that the symmetric encryption has been done and the key is a part of the source code itself. Insecure data storage in some cases. These are the common examples that can be, you know, very critical, uh, lead to very, uh, you know, very sensitive or critical type of security issues, vulnerabilities, and they can be exploited on a non-jail token device also. Right, so so that's pretty much it for me, guys. Uh, that's all I had for this session. I knew that the session is going to be one hour. It is really very difficult when 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 you have such a limited amount of time and you have to cover such an interesting topic and you have to cover so many technical and interesting um, part of the topic itself. So very difficult to choose what to talk about, what not to talk about. But this is all that I had for this session. Uh, again, thanks a lot to all of you for uh, joining on this session. Uh, uh, if you want to connect to us, you can go ahead to look at our website, drop us an email at hello at enciphers.com. You can find us on Twitter at enciphers. And that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I think, Prashant, uh, I'm not sure if you have a lot of time or not, but I uh, see a couple We of can take some questions, um, Abhinav. There are some okay. questions in the Q&A section. You can take some questions. Okay. Right. Can Frida objection be hooked into application without using USB cable? Yes. Actually, in one of our trainings, um, we actually used... Uh, uh, so you can use uh, remote flags with the with Frida itself, and you can actually use remote. You can um, hook into the application uh, application of the devices using IP address. So yes, that can be done. It it needs a little bit of tweaking. That is what we did with Corel We did in our last training in Nullcon uh, with Corelium devices. Uh, but yes, that can be done. So Satish, uh, the answer to your question is basically yes. Uh, so how to decompile the IPS source code for static source code? As can we as we do for APK? I just showed you. Um, I just showed in the call, Rajat, I think uh, if, you, if you saw this part, I think you already have the answer to it. Uh, Mobexler is Debian based. Yes, it is. It is Linux based. Uh, I think Linux Lite is what we are using right now into Mobexler Lite. The other one, the bigger version is basically uh, using elementary, which is again Ubuntu. Uh, Linux Lite is also Ubuntu, I think. Um, and that is, that is what it is using, yes. Uh, Okay, Rajat, Hopper is a paid tool. Does Mobexler has full version? Of course, no. The Mobexler does not have a full version of Hopper, but uh, Mobexler has Ghidra, which does the same thing as you saw uh, in this session. Uh, and you don't uh, probably need to buy Hopper unless you obviously uh, like it a lot. So uh, the, the version, the, the free version is a part of Mobexler, uh, but Ghidra is also a part of Mobexler, so you can use any of them as you like. Okay. Uh, quite often an application with malicious intent will obfuscate itself. How do you deal with obfuscated apps? Right, so this is very interesting question. Obfuscation is basically, in a lot of cases, to be, to be frank, in a lot of cases, obfuscation is something that stops you probably for a couple of initial hours. So the class names would be obfuscated. So what we are looking actually into the application while we are doing, obfuscation only stops you while, while you're doing the static analysis majorly. So while you're doing the static analysis, class name and um, methods and these type of parameters can be obfuscated. But this is only going to stop you for some time. So if you can hook into the application, I'll give you an example. Let's say that you're trying to find that which function is there, which is stopping, which is implementing SSL pinning, right? And you're not able to find, you decompile the application and because all the values, all the um, class names and everything is, is just obfuscated and you're not able to exactly point it out or search it that what function is being used what you can actually do is basically you can hook into the application and then using a runtime instrumentation, maybe using Frida, you can look into what type of uh, URL sessions are being invoked. And then at the same time, you can watch for a class or probably watch the application and, and, and try to find that what type of uh, classes or function are being invoked at certain point of function. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that these type of obfuscation are going to be a problem, of course, but they only stop you for initial few hours, but once you use the application for quite some time, you become familiar with what is happening inside the application, even if the class names and uh, other things are obfuscated a bit. I don't usually spend a huge amount of time uh, to de-obfuscate or things or, or so on and so forth. Uh, that's, that's just my approach. A lot of other pen testers are probably in some pen testers, some people in my team also um, might uh, used to de-obfuscate, but that's something that you have to build. So I don't usually de try to de-obfuscate anything. I just usually go with the application itself. And probably in a few hours, I end up 
finding what I'm looking for. So it has never happened that obfuscation has stopped me for a major chunk of uh, application. All right. I believe Hopper only gives the list of methods in the class, how to check uh, for the logic written behind it. So you'll have to learn a bit of reverse engineering, Rajat, actually. Um, once you learn a bit of reverse engineering, you can actually generate pseudocode. So if you're talking about Hopper, I'll tell you that Hopper, I think I closed it, but Hopper actually has an option of pseudo genetic pseudocode. So you can search for an option. Let's say that you search for login view controller. Now you looked at the login view controller source code, but you're not able to find the exact logic. So you can generate a pseudocode. The pseudocode will give you an idea of the, what the application is actually doing. Once you do that, once you look into that, then you can actually deduce, deduce the or generate a graph of it, or probably, I don't know, the flowchart of it. And then the flowchart will tell you in the hopper itself that how the logic is going. And that is how you actually generate get to know that what is what the application is doing with this part of the code. You'll have to learn a bit of reverse engineering, of course, if you want to work more into it. All right. Will the session recording be available uh, for later to watch? I think the answer is yes. I see a recording button. So I assume, uh, Prashant, you will be putting it on YouTube. I don't know where you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The session is recorded. So I, we have a was Area channel. I, I will share it on the meetup page as well. Yes. OK, great. So I think you have how we can check for logs on iOS application in Android. Oh, so iOS application, I don't know if you have. So if you have a Mac, you can just go to console. And once you have the console, you can select the iPhone from here. If you see my screen right now, I just selected iPhone and you can even search for. So console is an application. Xcode also has a feature. There are a lot of other tools also that you can use to look into the logs. So if I want to search for logs of, let's say, Uber, I can just filter the logs using Uber over here and look into it. If not, I can use abstractors, which I was using so far, and look into the logs over here. So as soon as I do that, you see a lot of logs are just popping up over here. So console is an application in Mac that you can use. There are a bunch of other applications also. Um, where was I? I forgot. OK, yeah, this one. How do we get the exact source code on reversing that? So exact source code is something that you don't get. Basically, in majority of the cases, you get class information and a disassembled um, part of the binary itself. That's that's what you get. Uh, no, you don't get the source code. Okay, Rahul, I answered that. Okay, uh, how do non-native applications like Flutter or React Native mobile apps affect either tooling or methodology? So methodology is not, I think, um, what I'll do is I have a blog, a couple of links for Flutter applications also, like bypassing SSL pinning and so on and so forth. So the logic, so the, remember that even if React Native application, there is just a layer um, above the iOS, which the React Native handles. So uh, behind React Native, the, the iOS is going to function in the same way. So uh, so let's talk, let's talk, for example, of uh, secure code uh, of uh, local storage. So that, so the values that the application is handling should, in any case, whether the application is based on React Native or Swift or Objective C, Objective C, if the JWT token is being saved into a plist file, it is going to be a problem. It is not the best ideal way of doing it, unless it is stored into the keychain. So even in other type of applications also, if the the data handling is done in the proper way that it should be done on the iOS, you are good. If not, it is not good. So the approach or methodology is going to be the same. How you do it or how you check it or how you bypass these security controls can be different. Like in Flutter applications also or React Native application based application also in Android, Xamarin based applications also. Um, these different platforms, these different type of programming languages, these different type of uh, uh, application builds actually give a layer just above the normal. So uh, normal application and that is, but the basis of it, but the root of uh, security issues are basically the same all the time. Right. Uh, thank you, Abhinav, for the. Okay, so that's not a question. <laughs> How to test certain apps in emulators that have the OTP functionalities and detects SIM cards? So I don't know, Rajat. Basically, I told you guys that this is. Uh, so in iOS case, basically you have to unfortunately use a real device itself. Um, uh, so so that you are probably bound there. So if you are using and uh, if the application. So if there is a functionality that the application is checking for an OTP and verifying the OTP to a client to a call through a call um, uh, to a backend API, I would guess that it would be better or easier solution to actually use a real device because you anyways have to use a real device and put a SIM card into it. But if it is just doing a pin check or some other checks on the client side, you can actually bypass that. So it shouldn't be a very big problem. All right. But in any case, you have to have a real device. How the tool updates 
are being managed inside mob excel so currently it is so at this point of time we are just we have just installed the tools and we are going to probably working on this is one of the things that we are going to work on the next part in which we are actually trying to uh, add one common file which would handle all the updates and you can just choose that what tools you want to update currently you have to manually update all of these uh, tools and we try to release frequently we try to release the new version of ova file so that you can just download it and you don't have to install upgrade but that is again going to be majorly solved into um, maybe future releases once we have that um, update functionality into the tool itself so that's right so that's pretty much all the question that we had i think i did not miss any uh, right so if uh, one other thing is if you guys are going to use mob excel if you see any issues please go ahead to github of mob excel and then just open the issues over here so that we can actually fix it on to the next release or so and so forth um so that it's easier for everybody so that's that's pretty much it from my side uh, uh prashant uh, okay there is one more question is it possible to proxy traffic of apple asso sign in or app store traffic yes why not i think uh, i think it is possible yes uh, app store traffic i think i have seen but uh, not sure about other application but i think it should be doable yes anything else guys prashant uh, i think that's it for all the questions uh, yeah. so thank you very much abhinav um, so yeah i will post the link uh, uh, sh and share the videos on the meetup page so thank you thank you again bye thank you prashant bye bye guys